Welcome to our webinar today, Preparing for ACA Reporting Deadlines and IRS Verification Audits, sponsored by Hub International. As a top 10 global insurance broker, Hub International offers property and casualty, life and health, employee benefits, investment, and risk management solutions. With offices across North America, Hub is uniquely positioned to tailor solutions to meet local needs. Our presenters today are Linda Keller, Employee Benefits Practice Leader, Hub International. Linda Keller is an Executive Vice President and a Hub International Employee Benefits Practice Leader. With proven leadership and 30 years of experience in the design and implementation of strategic health, ben health and benefits programs and funding alternatives, Linda serves the diverse needs of clients. She leads Hub's account management team, helping clients develop both short and long-term strategies that incorporate innovative wellness and benefits program design ensuring they achieve optimum return on their investments. Linda was certified in 2013 as a healthcare reform specialist by the Healthcare Reform Center and Policy Institute. Our other presenter, Jack McStravick, Chief Compliance Officer, Hub International. Jack provides compliance and consulting services to employers regarding health and other employee benefit administration. His area of expertise includes consulting with large employers on matters related to the implications of the Affordable Care Act, IRISA, ERISA, sorry, cafeteria plan, HIPAA, COBRA, FMLA, ADA, and human, related human resource matters. Prior to joining Hub, Jack worked for 17 years in human resource management for large corporations. In addition to his HR experience, he also practiced labor and employment law. Immediately before joining Hub, Jack worked as a regional compliance counsel for seven years at a large national employee benefits brokerage. He holds membership in several state bar associations. And our last presenter of today, Jack o Dan Openshaw, Openshaw, Director of Data Analytics of International. With 20 years' experience in the employee benefits consulting arena, Dan has been managing and delivering leading solutions in the retail, financial, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, and engineering industries. Prior to joining Hub, he began his employee benefits counseling consulting career with, Twin with Towers Parent in Connecticut. Today, he leads Hub, Hub analytic and underwriting teams promoting strategies that incorporate robust benefit program design, ensuring they achieve optimal financial goals. Please note that access to a recording of today's webinar and copy of webinar slides will be issued to attendees in the coming days. Zach, you may begin. Thank you very much. Today we're going to review the uh, what we call the ACA reporting and coverage verification timeline to give you visibility of what to expect over the remainder of this year or this reporting year. The IRS gave us a much needed present on December 28th in extending the due dates for the 6055 and 6056 reporting. The extensions for the 1095 forms that need to be sent to employees' homes uh, was extended from February 1st to March 31st, giving us an additional two months to submit these forms. Uh, the 6055 uh, reporting uh, is done by carriers who furnish 1095Bs to employees and self insured plans to furnish uh, individuals with 1095C. So you now have until March 31st to send those forms to employees. The 6056 reporting, which requires an employer to submit a 1094C along with its 1095Cs to the IRS, the extension for uh, employers that were not, file, not filing electronically uh, is now extended from February 29th to May 31st, 2016. For those employers who wish to file electronically, you now have an extension from March 31st to June 30th, quite quite an increase in time there. Three months on submitting the documents to the uh, to the forms to the IRS. These extensions are automatic. Uh, if you have already filed for an extension, it will be denied or it may not be granted at all. Recognize that the extensions that were provided are more generous than the extensions that you might have been able to ask for. Uh, if you're not able to meet the extension uh, or the extended due dates, you're still encouraged to file as soon as possible by the IRS. 
the penalties for not filing uh, your 6055 obligations or your 6056 obligations is $250 per failure to a maximum of $3 million. Relief is available if you are have submitted forms that have incorrect or incomplete information on the return statement. There's no relief available if you cannot show good faith that you uh, attempted to comply with the information reporting requirements or if you failed to timely file an information return. A failure that's due to reasonable cause uh, will be subject to uh, penalty relief if you're able to satisfy the reasonable cause criteria. To satisfy that criteria, the IRS will take many factors into consideration. For example, whether the reporting entity filed on time, uh, whether the uh, reporting entity uh, used uh, use the filing agent, whether they tested the, to transmit their forms, whether they were prepared to submit the forms uh, for 2015, uh, and whether they've taken any steps uh, for reporting in 2016. Notwithstanding any of these extensions, the IRS, again, encourages employers to file on time or file as soon as they're ready. The extended deadline for giving, uh, supplying furnishing forms to individuals falls just two weeks before the April 15th filing deadline for income, individual income tax returns. Uh, employees should be aware that they're not required to file the 1095 with their income tax returns as originally planned. They are encouraged to keep a copy of the 1095 that they were provided with their tax records. On the 1094, uh, on the 1040 income tax return form this year, it will be kind of like last year where individuals have the opportunity to just check a box that says that they had coverage uh, for themselves and their dependents and that the coverage was for all 12 months. Verification of the individual mandate and the employer mandate is a big job, and the verification process happens with the support of many governmental agencies that you can see that we've listed here. In addition to the federal agencies, the state exchanges will also participate in the verification process. And of course, we have individual insurers, carriers, employers, uh, that also participate in the verification process through their submitting of uh, 1095s or 1094s. The IRS will need to verify whether individuals maintain minimum essential coverage throughout the year. This will satisfy their obligation to uh, under the individual mandate. The IRS will also have to verify whether employers offered minimum essential coverage to 95% of the full-time population, 70% in 2015, and whether the coverage that was offered met minimum value and was affordable. The IRS will also need to verify whether uh, individuals who received tax subsidies at the exchange satisfy the income requirements to receive those tax subsidies. We've created a diagram here to illustrate what the IRS will be uh, verifying. They've created an, what's called the ACA Information Return System. Uh, it's abbreviated as the AIR system. And they're going to triangulate information from employers, from individuals, and from state exchanges to determine whether each of those entities have complied with the ACA. The information will flow to the IRS and back to employers through that determination process. If you are a uh, employer and you are planning to use a third-party administrator to transmit your information, meaning you've hired your payroll company or your HRS company to do so, 
then they will need to obtain what's called a transmitter control code from the IRS. If you're a do-it-yourselfer where you decide to file uh, 250 or more information returns and transmit that information directly to the IRS, uh, you're responsible for obtaining the transmitter control code. But first, you must register with eServices to obtain that code. After you've registered with eServices, you'll have access to the ACA application for a TCC or transmitter control code. To complete the registration process, you must log back into the e-services within 28 days of your registration to enter your confirmation code, which will received by the U.S. Postal uh, Mail. Carriers must also have a TCC to electronically file uh, their forms on the AIR system. To submit your forms, you must be using approved software and must pass, pass the applicable pre-filing test scenarios. This will ensure that you can communicate with the IRS before you submit information returns through the AIR system. You're only required to successfully complete the communication test once. However, uh, beginning on January uh, 19th, 2016, the IRS has deployed a more robust environment uh, upgrading their system from what they call Phase 1 uh, AATS uh, to a Phase 2 AATS. And during this cutover period, they uh, have requested that if you've passed the uh, test once, that you should try again in the more robust environment to be sure that you're still able to transmit. More information about uh, preparing yourself to file uh, can be found at the uh, on the links attached to this uh, slide, which will be sent to you. The general reporting uh, method requires that an employer file a report containing the following information. So this is uh, simply your basic name, rank, and serial number information that's submitted on uh, the 1094 and the 1095. It contains information like your EIN, your calendar year of your plan, name, telephone number of the contact person, and most importantly, a certificate of whether the employers offer its uh, full-time employees the opportunity to enroll in minimum essential coverage by calendar month. The additional information that's required to be reported, and this is reflected in the forms themselves, is whether the employer offered coverage to the full-time employee and their dependents, the total number of employees by calendar month, whether an employee's effective date of coverage was affected by a waiting period, whether the employer is a member of a control group. And these are all indicated uh, or items that you're asked for on the 1094. Uh, they'll also ask for a designated person, name, address, identity. Uh, uh, and phone number for a person that the IRS can reach in the event that uh, they have any questions. So now that we've done all the preliminary work and we're ready to file, um, we have to be aware that uh, the electronic filing for 2015 requires that you sub make your submission using an XML file uh, to the IRS. Transmissions to the AIR system are to be comprised only in one type of ACA, ACA information return, and you must include the appropriate transmittal form. So, for example, if you're submitting 1095Bs, it must be submitted with a 1094B. This is usually a submission that's made by a carrier. If you're an employer and you're submitting 1095Cs, it must be submitted with a single 1094C. Original and corrected forms cannot be combined in the same transmission file. The AIR system will process each submission and provide a status with detailed acknowledgement for the transmitter, uh, in some cases, which would be the employer. And the employer should retain those uh, returns, return information, uh, detailed acknowledgments for at least three years from the reporting date. So 
So what happens after we do our filing? Uh, the air system has established what's called a database schema, which uh, and and also business rules. Uh, the database schema is a set of formulas uh, which will call into question the integrity of the filing that's submitted to the IRS to ensure it's in a compatible format. The first phase of this uh, database schema is that the IRS will run a security check on the document that's submitted to make sure that it uh, can be read and uh, can be routed through the uh, air system uh, uh, through its entirety. If there's an error, the uh, an error code, the instructions uh, are to remove the infected data and retransmit the file. So the employer uh, will receive some notification from the IRS that their that their file that they tried to submit had some infected data, and they'll be notified of that. When errors are identified, such as uh, uh, employer information number or the employer's name and they don't match, the employer, uh, the air system, uh, or the air system can't read or write the XML file, then the file will be rejected and an error code will be sent to the, uh, to the transmitter. Once a transmission has been successfully submitted to the IRS, the transmitter will receive an acknowledgement for that transmission. That's when your file moves forward to the back end of the system and they begin to apply business rule checks uh, against the forms. This phase uh, is a phase where the employer checks or the IRS checks against uh, some of the specific ACA criteria about offers of coverage to determine whether or not a penalty is assessed. The next slide that we're looking at here shows both the uh, database schema and the business rules that will be applied to all transmissions. The database schema, as I just mentioned, covers security matters, uh, TIN information uh, and employer name matching, basically data integrity. And the business rules apply the ACA compliance rules for the individual mandate and the employer mandate specifically whether MEX coverage was offered, whether it was offered to full-time employees, whether it was affordable and met minimum value. The unique identifiers assigned by the AIR system and the business rules allows for the correction of uh, transmittal codes. So if an employer used incorrect transmittal codes, there may be an error that's sent back to the employer with the opportunity to correct that form. Uh, the 1094C can be submitted alone when the correction deals only with the 1094C. If you're correcting a 1095C, each submission back to the system requires a 1094C. Corrections can only be made to previous submissions that have been accepted or accepted with errors. Transmissions containing correction correction records must only contain corrections and should not include any original documents. So if you've submitted your originals and you get a request for a correction, don't send it back in uh, along with any other originals that you may have omitted the first time. So what happens after filing, and I know this is the, probably the most important part uh, for most employers is when do I get notified of a penalty, if, if any. Uh, and this, this last phase is, is the phase at which you'll receive those notices. So the IRS will ensure that the employer receives certification that one or more employees has received a premium tax credit. So if one of your employees receives a premium tax credit, they're going to notify you. Now this employee that receives a premium tax credit may or may not be a full-time employee. So it may or may not impose a penalty on you. The IRS will contact employers to inform them of the potential liability and provide them an opportunity to respond before any liability is assessed or a notice of demand for payment is made. 
if it's determined that an employer is liable for an employer share responsibility payment after the employer has responded to the initial IRS contact, the IRS will send a notice and demand for payment. The notice will instruct the employer on how to make the payment. The employer will not be required to include the employer share responsibility uh, payment on any tax return filed. So it sounds like uh, that the payments will be required be required outside of the uh, annual tax return filing season. The IRS uh, is auditing itself throughout this uh, development of the air system and on, on an ongoing basis for continuous process improvement. This year was tougher than uh, is expected to be in the future years because there were many tax law changes that occurred at the end of the year, which required an updating of the, of the forms. There was legislative action and regulatory changes that ge generated many challenges for the uh, IRS uh, shortly before this year's filing season. The Internal Revenue Service will continue to uh, audit uh, their own activities with regard to uh, correctly identifying individuals who may have received a premium tax credit that weren't entitled to one, whether they were able to collect, uh, collect uh, data from employers, whether they were able to obtain uh, employer share responsibility penalties and so forth uh, throughout the, the course of the next number of years in an effort to improve the system as they move forward. This uh, concludes our segment on the uh, reporting verification process, but you should be aware that the Department of Labor Employee Benefit Security Administration has also committed to conducting their own audits, if you will, uh, on uh, health and welfare plans by uh, beginning to audit employer health and welfare plans for the first time since 2012. Those audits are expected to start perhaps later this year uh, originally, it was supposed to be in May. It's probably later than that. This, this uh, now that we've got the reporting requirements under underway, but they'll be looking typically for plan documents, and they will be examining for the first time 5,500 filings, and they're also going to be looking at medical claims to be sure that they're being paid in accordance with the contract, and as fiduciaries of a of a health and welfare plan. It's our responsibility to make sure that our medical claims and prescription drug claims are being paid, paid in accordance with those contracts. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Linda Keller, who will talk about how you can manage your risk. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jack, for that information. Uh, Everyone, this is Linda Keller, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, now that Jack uh, gave you guys all the heads up about uh, what you need to do to file, just really how do you uh, manage your risk in case of an audit? So what are those best practices that you need to do uh, to prepare yourself? Um, really two things that we're going to focus on uh, to effectively manage your risk. One is, is that you have a clear understanding of ACA and how you as an employer have chosen to manage it. And and then two is uh, creating a fiduciary file to help you document exactly what you're doing. So let's start with that clear understanding of ACA. Uh, Jack definitely reviewed some of these items in a little bit more detail, but from a high level, just making sure that you have uh, a documentation on all of the items that I've listed here. So uh, if you are a, a an employer who's at that edge of 50 to, to 51 employees, how did you determine whether or not you were an applicable large employer? Um, really, what kind of safe harbor did you utilize and, and uh, how did you determine that, that safe harbor? Some documentation on variable hour tracking. You know, what measurement period are you using? What is the stability period that you're using? And any other items that we've included here. Just really understanding those pieces of ACA that you could be questioned on to say, how did you make these determinations? And show us the documentation that you have in terms of how you manage that process. Really, you want to start today, right? Look your best. Don't wait until you get a notice of an audit to start compiling all of your documents. 
um, focusing on the documents that are required um, through the agencies. Um, so those are those are, are, are available to you um, as as information on our website. Um, and also focusing on the administration administrative processes um, that are in place as well. So as an example, uh, on the administrative processes, how are you managing variable employees? So if you've determined that certain employees are not full-time, how are you actually managing that? How did you make that determination? What reporting system are you utilizing to tracking their hours? Uh, what kind of post post uh, measurement period are you are you utilizing to determine whether or not they were considered full time? Um, if you needed to collect social security numbers, what was the process that you utilized to collect those numbers? How many times did you reach out to get the collection of those social security numbers? That type of thing. So again, just documenting the administrative processes that you have in place in order to make sure that you're in compliance with all of the requirements. Um, making sure that you are not putting any, anything into place that may create those red flags out there. So, for example, we were talking about how do you manage your variable employees. One of the things that you want to make sure that you, you don't have is a paper trail that says uh, something to the effect of, gosh, we've uh, noticed that this employee is trending towards full time. You know, uh, please make sure that you are not giving them any hours in the fourth quarter um, so that they don't end up a full time employee. Those are some red flags of something that you really don't want to have out there. So making sure that you're not, um, not uh, uh, ha don't have a paper trail um, and those red flags out there. And then really correcting failures as you find them. Um, certainly there are going to be some issues that come out uh, through any audit, but as you're putting together your a documentation and you identify we really don't have a process for this in place. Starting that process now um, so that you're correcting those failures as you find them rather than waiting for the audit to come uh, to come to your door. You're going to want to show that good faith effort that you've done everything you can uh, to correct those issues. So how, how are you, do you make yourself ready for an audit? Let's talk about five best practices that uh, you can adopt uh, to just make sure that you're ready. One of those is de designating employee status for your employees. So identifying whether an employee upon hire um, is a full-time, part-time, or variable employee. And then making sure that your employee handbook and all of your materials match uh, what you've designated uh, for those employees. Developing a three to five year strategic plan. You know, the reason that's really important is because it, it, it allows you to determine how you're managing things like your contribution strategy. So how are you making sure that your plans continue to stay affordable? Um, or if you have the need to add an additional uh, one of the, uh, the, the metal spectrums to your plan. So for example, you have plans, but uh, you really are struggling to keep them affordable for your employees. Do you need to add a bronze plan to your suite of plans offered uh, to make sure that you have a plan that's affordable for your employees? So really developing out your three to five year plan uh, to make sure that you continue to stay in compliance as you move forward. Making sure, as I mentioned, that all of your wording and all of your materials matches what uh, your employee facing materials. So uh, just being consistent in what you're telling employees and what you're using internally. And then training your managers on your concerns um, uh, or on anything that they, that they may uh, need to to be aware of. So again, kind of going back to that variable employee tracking, making sure that the managers understand that they should be tracking hours um, throughout, consistently throughout the year, and not just waiting for the fourth quarter of your tracking period to start managing those hours. So really making sure that they understand what they can and cannot do. And creating an action plan, uh, you are absolutely going to have things that are going to fall out. Uh, Jack mentioned this when he was when he was talking. There are going to be uh, the, those requests for penalty demands. Um, employees are going to appeal uh, if they were receiving a subsidy and are now told that they shouldn't have been. Uh, different things like that, and so really being prepared and documenting how you're going to respond to uh, to those uh, demands or appeals or whatever it may be. 
And then lastly, really utilizing technology. Uh, the ability to do all this and manage this through technology is, is really uh, a great tool for you because um, it really gives you that, that trail that you're looking for to show exactly what was done. Now, one of the things that uh, we certainly uh, recommend is that uh, you look at whether or not when you're doing your reporting, whether or not you want to do that reporting in-house or outsource it to a technology vendor. And while I'm sure that many of you have already identified how you're going to manage it, you know, make sure that as you're looking at those vendors that you're taking a look at some of the things that we've listed here on this slide when you're vetting a solution. These are things that can pop up as you're, you're running the actual, uh, the actual filing uh, as things that might create problems for you. So, for example, you know, does the system flag for rate of pay changes? And then following that, do they have automatic calculations of affordability? So if somebody did have a rate uh, pay change throughout the year, uh, does it still track that, uh, that affordability calculation? Um, what we've seen is that there's a lot of uh, questions that are coming out now that these vendors are starting to run the reports. Um, as you can imagine, there are so many situations of different types of, of employees um, and different things that happen through the course of an employee's uh, time that that change a lot of their um, the reporting for those employees. And not every scenario has been built into the system yet. So um, you definitely have to be prepared uh, to, to work with your vendor on how those things are going to be managed. Um, and most of all, have patience. Um, remember that everyone is going through this together for the first time. Time. We're, we're all learning a lot of uh, a lot of different things that uh, you know. I guess it's special situations that you didn't know happened out there, and uh, and 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 we'll all just get better at it the second year. And then one last thing that I want to say in this regard, which is really um, one of the most important things to do, is to think about okay, so if these are the things that 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 are creating challenges, how do I make sure that I'm managing them correctly in 2016? So well. In, in the 2015 reporting, I'm going to have to show good faith efforts. For my 2016 reporting, I'm going to have to get it right. And so really, we've already started the tracking of the data, right? It started January 1 for your 2016 filing in 2017. So really taking a look at how that data is being managed today to make sure that when you're reporting again next year, that you've got all, everything in place, all of the data being re, re, uh, recorded correctly so that you can do the filing um, as needed next year as well. So focusing from there now on to creating a fiduciary file, really what you want to create the fiduciary file for is so that when you get that notice from um, whoever's going to come in and do an audit, whether it's the IRS or a Department of Labor audit, and they're coming in and they want to take a look at things, that you've already got everything cap captured into one file. Um, that way you're not at that point in time trying to find all of the data that you have um, throughout the systems. So really the objective here is to just keep it all together in one place so that you can turn it over and hand it to somebody when they come in to do the, uh, the audit. Um, doesn't matter whether or not you're doing that in an electronic or paper format, the key here is really to just to make sure that you have it all and that you have it all in one place. And then certainly there are some tools that are available to help you as you go through this process. Um, there are multiple checklists available on what is needed by size of client, by date, um, sample designation forms. If you were looking to say, how do we um, identify somebody as a variable hour or seasonal employee or full time and part time? Uh, what what does that look like if I want to if I want to notify employees of that when they're hired and or put it in my handbook? Um, Cadillac Tax eBook. Well, we haven't really focused on the Cadillac Tax because uh, of the extension on that to 2020. Um, at this point in time, it still does sit out there for 2020. So you just want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on that as you're making all the other changes as well. And then really um, a sample of the fiduciary file. So what would a fiduciary file look like? All of that is available um, on our website. So you can go and look at some of those tools if you wanted to see them. And last thing I want to say here is just remember that you can, you can clean your house one day, um, but if you don't stay on top of it, 
you can return to chaos very quickly. So just making sure that you are continuing to keep on top of this and keeping your house clean. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dan Openshaw so that he can talk about a couple of other areas uh, related to uh, related to strategy and um, audits. Dan? Fantastic. Thank you, Linda. I'm going to shift focus just a little bit here now to um, talk about some of the, the tactics and actions that you can take now or in the near future. Linda talked a little bit about creating a um, – excuse me here, we have a little – that's the order rewind issue here. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things you need to do to create a strategic plan uh, for the, the ACA and some of these actions in the short term here. But let's talk about long term and how this can roll out over a three, five year, maybe even seven year strategy. Considering cost, uh, as is on all your radar, really focus on your plan design. If you haven't evaluated a CDHP, do so now. Look at it. Um, it can save you money. A lot of you have had concerns about uh, what a member or an employee may think doing so. But as you've seen in some of the studies, the adoption of CDHP has, has grown significantly. These are uh, plans that have immediate cost savings for you and for your employees. In terms of cap capitated managed care in some of your regions uh, around the country, this may be very strong. You may find some cost savings by doing so. And consider the new world of ACOs that we hear a lot about. Encourage your members to utilize them. They have an incentive themselves to manage the care better, and therefore uh, costs return to you. Prescription drugs and the management of prescription drugs. We've heard for years to manage your generics, but really what we've seen lately is that uh, looming specialty drug cost which is 5, 10, 15, maybe even north of that as a percentage of your medical, of your uh, prescription drug spend. So really design a plan that monitors medication through some level of prior authorization or step therapy with quantity level limits. Consider those new patients with a new treatment and uh, testing out a new drug that is very costly. Instead of providing 30 days of that drug, maybe we scale that back and provide 15 days with ongoing education and therapy management. Um, there was a study done recently um, evaluating the, the public exchanges <clears throat> in plans that had narrow networks versus those that had broad networks and found a differential of about 15% between that same plan design on a narrow network, so a select group of special uh, providers you know, with a lower cost strategy uh, has been significant savings. So that is an option as you look at your plan design consider potentially offering a plan with a narrow network or all plans in a narrow network. Population health management, your employees really are the key to everything you do. And identifying those risks in your population and those chronic conditions that will be either future cost drivers or a driving cost today, if you can manage that, that will increase your productivity on the job and the overall quality of life for those employees and then your costs in return. If you haven't done so, currently or if you haven't done so in a while, seriously evaluate self-funding, not only for that immediate premium tax reduction upwards of about 4% you can save, but that additional flexibility gives you in terms of designing a plan to lower costs, um, you know, avoiding potential state mandates, and in some cases even uh, ACA, ACA uh, essential benefits. So through your design and your desires to contain costs, you know, that creativity you may have, be careful. Avoid some of the no-nos. And some of those are really ensuring that you are not paying for individual policies in any way, shape, or form. Some of these vendor payment schemes are very problematic in, in terms of how the agency looks at this. It's very potential that there would be a significant penalty for these violations. Section 125 cafeteria plans cannot be used in any way to purchase individual coverage, even if fully funded by the employer. For those of you who have adopted a wellness program, make sure it is well communicated that the incentives you have in place meet the final regulations and they're keeping affordability in mind when you set those levels. And don't forget to document and communicate effectively that reasonable alternatives and appeal process for your employees. Beware of discrimination rules. Uh, there are new rules uh, affecting benefits all over, and one of those being gender transition tied to federal benefits. Be aware of that and make sure you're compliant in that case. And as always, termination of employees based on hours or suspension of hours is, is a no-no, as, as Linda had mentioned. 
be cautious with vendors also who play really close to that line or some type of a scheme to avoid tax or to save you money. We're seeing a lot of those come out of the woodwork. So one highly discussed topic is uh, cash in lieu, or really those opt-out incentives and providing them to or encouraging them potentially to take that cash instead of your benefits. This is currently in a comment period, uh, but the IRS assumes and it's really promised future detailed regulation. However, starting in 2017, employers cannot pay opt-out incentives without creating or trading the amount that is opt-out as a, as a required contribution. So essentially, you're combining that employee cost for the premium plus that opt-out that opt amount. Um, that has to be taken into account when you look at affordability. For many of you, this may have a dramatic impact on your affordability rate, and you really have to take a look at this. Again, this is still a comment, and we're re awaiting French relief um, of this regulation. But we've been um, waiting for quite a few years now on this uh, fully insured uh, understanding of how we're to, to identify whether we're discriminating. Um, preliminary indications are that the IRS is considering discrimination rules that are determined not based on the eligibility of the plan, but actual participation. And we're hoping that uh, with this, there'll be some level of safe harbor, potentially with a minimum value plan and affordable coverage. The process, again, unknown, but we'd assume be similar to a 401k. So end of your audit, um, evaluating whether you are discriminatory or not with action plan. Late December of 2015 uh, was a, you know, a break. We've got a little bit more information in notice 2015-87 where the IRS clarified or attempted to clarify a little bit more the counting of hours, relieving employers of counting so many hours, and especially those unworked hours. In terms of affordability, this affects both your full-time and non-full-time employees, but differently. So in a nutshell, the hours of service encompass the actual hours worked, any paid time off, whether that's vacation, holiday, or illness, unpaid FMLA, military, and jury duty. The takeaway from the notice was that does not include the workers' comp, state required FTD, or unemployment. So this is good news for many of us, a little clarification there. But in the end, don't go it alone. Um, know who your experts are. If you don't have them, find them and counsel with them frequently. So whether that's your broker or consultant to develop a three to five year strategic plan or incorporating your accountant and legal counsel to identify and understand control groups or issues, or maybe all three, engaging all three when you do have an audit, um, you really need to know who they are, identify them, meet with them frequently, and have those conversations that really keep you in line with what you need to be doing correctly, keep you out of the realm of error. Um, Although 2020 is, a, is far off and, you know, we know that the land the Cadillac tax lost some of its sting with uh, the deductibility of it, this is one strategy you should keep in place. And that's back to my earlier comments around costs. You really should put a strategy in place that is mitigating your potential liability. Um, you can do that today and gradually make movements to avoid that tax in the future. I'll now uh, turn it back over to Linda um, to address some of the audit best practices. So I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about just a few final pages here for you to talk about uh, when the IRS comes to call. So how do you make sure that you're winning when they're when they're coming in to do their desk audit? It really first is, is meeting the deadline. So when, when the IRS says that they're coming in on a certain date, you need to have everything available, uh, be, be ready and available on that date. And going back to the previous discussions, the way that you're ready is that you have everything already documented, available, you've created the fiduciary file, and when they walk in the door, you've already got everything. So that's the easiest way to make sure that you can meet the deadline and do not have a need to ask for an extension. Really organizing the materials as best as possible. Um, it's certainly very difficult for an auditor to come in and be given a pile of, of, of a bunch of papers without any organization. Um, your greatest way to make sure that you pass that audit is to make it as easy for them to read and find the information as possible. So make sure that you're, you're providing that ease of use. And then really communicating with, uh, with the individuals, with the auditors, with respect and tact. Um, so 
uh, you know, making sure these folks go in every day to firms and are auditing. And as I'm sure you can imagine, most people are not really happy to see them. And so your ability to make them feel like, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're there to work with them, you're glad to provide them with the information that they need. You may not have to go so far as to say we're really happy to have you, but regardless, really providing them with that respect and tact will go a long way. And uh, lastly, some best tips for those on-site audits, you know, really uh, controlling the process. So you absolutely can schedule the conference room. You can determine whether or not that conference room has a computer or phone. They will be providing their own uh, uh, um, laptops, and so you don't have to have uh, other other tools in the room. Um, really trying to, to keep them to that area and that, that all questions go through you rather than, than kind of walking around and asking questions of other people. That's absolutely okay. You can control that process with those reasonable rules. Um, really being professional and, as I said, courteous when, when that individual is coming in. We talked about organizing the materials and just making it as easy as possible for them to find what they're looking for. Providing everything that's requested. So if there is something that you do not have that you are um, responding to, here are all of the things you requested, this is the one piece that we do not have, um, and an and explanation as to why you do not have them. And then resisting that urge to overshare. Sometimes we can provide too much information, and in providing too much information, it may raise some other red flag that you weren't even thinking about. So providing all of the information that's requested and only the information that's requested. And really addressing any of the auditor's ground rules. So what rules do they have in place and what are the things that you want to make sure that you're complying with um, to make them and their job as, uh, as go as cleanly as possible? So we've really spent um, our time today really talking about the audit itself and then, I mean, the uh, reporting itself and then uh, what happens just in case uh, you're, you're going to be audited and how you prepare for that. And with that, we're going to wrap up and answer some of the questions that we've received. All right. So I do have some questions here. The first one is for Jack. What code do I use if minimum essential coverage is provided free to our employees? Okay. Uh, so if minimum essential coverage is provided for free to employees, the employer uh, completing a 1095C can use code 1A on line 14 Uh, they would leave line 15 blank, and if the employee elected coverage, they should use code 2C on line 16. Now, HUB is really not in a position to provide advice to attendees on the codes required for ACA reporting. And these are tax forms, and any information that we provide today should be reviewed with the vendor you're using for filing or your attorney or your CPA. But uh, if an employer provides free coverage, then I would say on line uh, 14, use code 1A, leave line 15 blank, and use code 2C if the employee accepts the coverage on line 16. Okay, thank you. The next question is also for you, Jack. What code do I use if the employee waives coverage? Okay, uh, again, the disclaimer. Uh, and uh, if an employee waives coverage, this is a tricky question because the uh, instructions are not very clear on this point. However, uh, we've come to learn from the IRS that we've, who we've spoken to about this issue that uh, the line 14 and line 15 codes would be the same as you would for all of your other employees who are offered coverage. But the difference comes on line 16. Uh, here, the uh, employer would use codes 2F, 2G, or 2H on line 16, depending on the safe harbor used for affordability. But again, check that with your vendor, your attorney, or your CPA. 
Thank you. The next question uh, for Linda and or Dan. Are there still vendors out there who can help us prepare these forms? So I will answer that question. Uh, yes, there are still vendors out there that can help you prepare the, the form. So if you, uh, as an employer, originally thought that you would do this on your own, um, and as you start to go through this, you realize that it's much more complex than you originally anticipated or is going to take much more time than originally anticipated and want to utilize a vendor to do the reporting for you, um, there are absolutely vendors that still have some capacity. Um, I'm going to tell you that the majority of the vendors did close capacity probably around October or November of last year, but a lot of them did that based on the deadlines and their ability to get the information and get the forms completed in time for the deadlines. Since those deadlines have been extended, um, a number of those, those same providers are able to assist other clients who may not have already reached out to them uh, because they have a, a bit more time to do that. And that is all that we have time for. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending our webinar, Preparing for ACA Reporting Deadlines and IRS Verification Audits, sponsored by Hub International. Please note that access to a recording of this webinar and a copy of the webinar slides will be issued to attendees in the coming days. Please visit hubemployeebenefits.com slash outlook-2016 to learn more about taking action on ACA reporting.